Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in. We're going to charge ahead by charging ahead further in this book entitled Code Word Barbalon, 666 Danger in the Vatican, The Sons of Loyola and Their Plans for World Domination by P.D. Stewart. This book is available through Lux Verbi Books. You can go to www.luxverbi, that is L-U-X-V-E-R-B-I Books. Dot com and order this book. I highly recommend it. I want all my listeners to buy this book. And I know that's a, a large thing to ask, but that's what I would prefer, that my listeners would buy this book and read it for themselves and share it with friends and family. This is the latest and greatest book written, a total expose of the Vatican Jesuit-led New World Order. And I chose this book to read as lengthy as it is because it is the best source of education that I have in my possession that I can relay over uh, Internet radio to show the Vatican Jesuit-led New World Order. Again, Code Word Barbalon by P.D. Stewart. Now, we were talking about the constitutions of the Jesuits, the ultra-secret constitutions of the Jesuit order, which by a fluke of what I would call divine providence, were finally exposed to public scrutiny when a Jesuit priest back in the 1700s who had financed a vast trading uh, shipping uh, concern was delinquent in paying his creditors and was brought up on charges. Lavalette was his name, and in the course of the trial, uh, committed a tremendous blunder from the Jesuits' point of view. He made mention in open court about the constitutions of the Jesuits, and that made the constitutions available for court scrutiny. And that's when France learned for itself what the Jesuit order was all about, and that resulted immediately in the suppression of the Jesuits and their expulsion from France. That document reveals the hideous crimes to which the Jesuit order may commit themselves to the attainment of a one-world government over which the Pope would rule supreme. And one of those, one of those, uh, tenets of operation validated and supported in the constitutions was regicide, that of killing kings to achieve their diabolical aims, which I'll briefly review is to destroy Protestantism to extirpate the world of heresy or and heretics and to raise the Pope to world domination, world control. Now we'll pick up where we left off. It said the constitutions further revealed that in order to fulfill the society's mission, the members of the order would create philosophies of left and right so that the world would be divided into opposing factions. Now, P.D. Stewart is making reference to what we often refer to as the Hegelian dialectic. In other words, to foment change in the world, the most efficient means is to divide the world into opposing factions and then pit those opposing factions against one another in conflict and war, and then operate on both sides of the line, managing the outcome. The Jesuits would operate on both sides of the conflict, in disguise, in high places of authority, and manage the outcome of the conflict, and then be prepared 
to uh, write the armistice and the settlement, the terms of settlement. And little by little, operating over and over and over again, this Hegelian dialectic, fomenting discord and, and, and strife, fomenting a confrontation, a war, managing the outcome and then settling the dispute by the terms of the agreements ri- arising out of the conflict to little by little incrementally serve the purpose of this ultimate goal of a one world, one world government by the Pope. It's called the Hegelian dialectic and they use it expertly. No one is better at operating and uh, manipulating the world through the Hegelian principle. And he says, needless to say, as a result of these discoveries, that is, uncovered in the constitutions of the Jesuits, the Jesuit order was dissolved in 1762. Now, that conflicts a little bit with what I understand. I don't know if this is a misprint or not, but the... uh, the Jesuits were suppressed by a papal bull in 1773. But nonetheless, the book says the Jesuit order was dissolved in 1762, and finally in 1764 the sons of Loyola were driven out of France, mainly because of their attachment to the bloody doctrines of regicide, the killing of heads of state, the assassinations of heads of state, and the obstinate refusal to modify their constitutions. We shall learn much more on that later in the book. So the constitutions of the Jesuits, among many, many other horrors, sanctions, regicide, assassinations. And this is why the Jesuit order were were kicked out of France. And... That's why they should be kicked out of the United States and every country in the world. They should be publicly exposed for what they are. The world should demand that the Je- the world should demand that the Jesuit order make public their constitutions, so that the world may see for themselves how the Jesuits operate. And if the Jesuits won't produce those constitutions, then whatever forcible means necessary to get those constitutions and and produce them for world scrutiny. Okay, Ed, the Jesuits are an enemy of every nation on the planet. Their goal is to destroy all national sovereignties. To redivide the world, reset the boundaries, thus thereby destroying all the constitutions and all the forms of government. I mean, look, if you, if you change, if you just arbitrarily change the borders of the nations, what does that do to their, the constitutions of the sovereign nations that previous, previously existed? They're ipso facto default. They're null and void, right? I mean, common sense tells you that that if we're going to uh, just arbitrarily create a North American Union, a union of Canada, Mexico, and the United States, and redraw the borders to include all three as to, in one nation, what does that do to the Constitution of the United States? It's ipso facto destroyed. And that's That's what they're doing, destroying sovereignties, national sovereignties, and out of the destruction that results of the constitutions of those once sovereign nations, they rewrite the laws. They form a new government. And that's what is taking place right before our very eyes. People don't understand why the government seems so unresponsive to the demands of its peoples. Because we're under a, a new form of government. We, we we live in a brand new nation. It's not similar in any respect to the one that we believe that we still belong to. 
The United States, as we know it, is over. The North American Union is in place. It's up and operating. The Constitution remains in public view, but they don't go by it. And that just to keep the people quiet and passive and satisfied. And a little by little, let the people on their own come to the realization that it's over. And that during the period of that realization coming to our minds, we've been living under a different government, a different order, and already set precedent. And the people have no right to rebel. That's where we're at. That's where we're at right now. You know, I've said many times on the program, the new world order is already up and running. They just haven't told the people yet. And they're just letting us find out little by little. Okay, I'm going to continue. Under the subtitle, In Defense of the Jesuits, the author writes, To be fair to the Jesuits, they did make a reply to the above charges entitled, Response O Assertions, attempting to discredit the facts connected, collected by the, the commissioners of the French Parliament. It described the greater part of the commissioner's report as malicious fabrications. But the Jesuits' reply was feeble and ineffectual. Moreover, Henry Hadley Norris, the author of The Principles of the Jesuits, assures us that the charges of the French Parliament against the Jesuits were independently verified. He writes, quote, To ascertain the validity of this, the said impeachment of the Jesuits, the libraries of the two universities of the British Museum and the Sion College have been searched for the authors cited, and in every instance where the volume was found, the correctness of the citation established. Unquote. In the end, after a thorough investigation, the French Parliament gave a most thunderous denunciation of the Jesuit order. Now, this is French Parliament. This is equivalent to the United States Congress. The French Parliament gave a most thunderous denunciation of the Jesuit order. And I read, and, and, and quoting here, it says, quote, the aforementioned institute, that is the Jesuit order, tending to introduce into the church and the state. Now remember, under the Jesuit direction, there's no wall of separation between the church and the state. The Jesuits operate both in politics and in religion. They go hand in hand. Okay? Tending to introduce into the church and the state under the specious veil of a religious institute. You know, everybody thinks the Jesuits are a religious institution, benevolent and uh, charitable, when in fact they are nothing but warriors, soldiers for the Pope, to take the world by storm, by force if necessary, to raise the Pope to world supremacy. That is their job. And if they fail in that job, they cease to be Jesuits. He says, under the specious veil of a religious institute is not an order which aspires truly and only to evangelistic perfection, but rather a body politic whose gasoline consists in a continual activity to arrive by all kinds of ways, direct or indirect, in secret or in public, the usurpation of any authority to form a widespread, immense body in all the states without really forming part of it. In other words, completely detached from what they're trying to accomplish, can exert its empire on the men of any state and of any dignity so that it gets members in the various nations. And by its constitutions has the execution of the plan that the aforementioned company, the Jesuit order, had proposed to acquire immense riches while preparing in the shade by veiling nevertheless its intentions 
adopting for its doctrines the fatal teaching which makes it possible to calumniate, to persecute, and to even kill in any state where it be introduced by its consequent control with its constitutions and tends to undermine little by little any legitimate authority, any administration, and to destroy the bond of all the parts of the body politic, all the more alarming that the laws of the aforesaid institute are a true fanaticism reduced to a theory. So dangerous a company, nothing could stop since this time the course of the doctrines of regicide. Unquote. Wealth and power, the usurpation of all authority, They're like bull moose in a china shop. They've got a job to do. Their constitution gives them the means to do it, and they do it. And nations of the world who find out their means and methods and their goals kick them out of the country, repeatedly if necessary. But the United States of America has never uttered one word of reproach to the Jesuit order. And if you want to know what the result of that ignorance and apathy is, simply read Revelation chapter 13. That's how the United States, that lamb-like nation, began to speak like a dragon. The second beast of Revelation 13 is the United States in Bible prophecy. That's because we have turned our back, closed our eyes, plugged our ears, closed our mouths, and allowed the Jesuits to operate unhindered in this country. The most powerful superpower in the world. And they've simply harnessed the power of this country and used it to bring the rest of the world into the papal fold. And while at the same time the Jesuits fomented the ecumenical movement to, to corrupt the spirits of God's people, to induce them to join, rejoin the Roman Catholic Church, to have fellowship with this, this Roman cult, Catholicism. And the, the Catholic Church, together with the newfound power vested in the breast of the heretic, I call them ecumenical, evangelical bellies, now has a mandate. This ecumenical union of Protestantism back to the Roman Catholic Church through the ecumenical movement has now handed the Pope and his priests in the United States a mandate. We're going to have a Christian country. Trouble is, they never tell us that it's going to be a Catholic country. And that's just how shrewd and subtle and diabolical the Jesuit order and the Roman Catholic Church is. But I intend to uncover this ecumenical movement and let God's people see for themselves what a diabolical hoax it is. And P.D. Stewart's going to help me do it. Now back to the book, it says, and what is their ultimate objective in all this intrigue? What is the grand ambition, their avowed aim? Listen carefully. Total world domination at any cost and by any means. So says Fyodor Dostoevsky in an exquisitely written passage from his book, The Brothers Karamazov, where he says, those, were, those are the worst of the Catholics, the Inquisitors, the Jesuits. They are simply the Romish army of the earthly sovereignty of the world in the future, with the pontiff of Rome for emperor. That's their ideal. Something like a universal serfdom. There's your, your new world order. Listen to what Dostoevsky says. He says something like a universal serfdom. 
That is the new world order, a universal global world serfdom. With them, the Jesuits, as their master. That's all they stand for. They don't even believe in God, perhaps, unquote. Certainly, they do not believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They believe in another God. A counterfeit Messiah figure of Rome, the Pope, who calls himself the vicar and the replacement of Christ, who seeks to establish an earthly, worldly, temporal kingdom that encompasses the entire globe, and that is destined to extirpate those who seek the true heavenly kingdom of Christ. And that's what's going to happen in this country and around the world. Now, continuing, it says, this is, that is to say, if Dostoevsky, Dostoevsky is right, the total destruction of democratic society and its laws upon the ruins of which would plant they would plant their ultramontane ideals, their radical papist ideals. Historians, J- historian James A. Wiley explains the Jesuit enterprise from another perspective. Quote, Of the craft of the Jesuits, the arts they employed, the disguises they wore, the seditions they sowed, the snares they laid for the life of the sovereign, that is, princes and kings and queens, and the plots they concocted for the overthrow of the Protestant church. We shall have much opportunity to speak when we come to narrate the history of Protestantism in Great Britain, unquote. In particular, and that's where we're headed, we're going to talk about the history of Protestantism in Great Britain to show you how the Jesuits operate in the world. It's the coming chapter, and it's going to be very enlightening for those who are not familiar with it. Continuing, it says, in particular, we shall look at the scheme to destroy in one fell swoop the entire monarchy, that is of Great Britain, the Parliament, and the most senior judges of England. It was such diabolical schemes that further prompted Wiley to say, quote, What a harvest of plots, tumults, seditions, revolutions, torturings, poisonings, assassinations, regicides, and massacres has Christum reaped from the seed sown by the Jesuits, unquote. And as if, and as if that was not enough, he adds grimly, quote, nor can we be sure that we have seen the last of the greatest of their crimes, unquote. James A. Wiley was correct. He could not have imagined the crimes that the Jesuits would com- would commit in the world. And we're going to talk about one of those crimes in the next chapter of the book. But now it's appropriate to talk about 9-11. That's the magnitude of the atrocities committed by the Jesuit order to foment war to work their Hegelian dialectic, to achieve their desired aim, and that is to raise the papacy to world supremacy in a new world order. And we'll continue with the reading of the book, Code Word Barbalon, when we return from the break. You're listening to Inquisition Update on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. We'll be right back. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on satellite, internet, or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, We ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, 
we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a re-established Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions, and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using Scripture to interpret Scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit Cross the Border. Dot org, C-R-O-S-S, cross the border, dot org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. Okay, welcome back to Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. I'm going to return immediately to the book. J.A. Wiley says... We cannot be sure that we've seen the last of the greatest of their crimes, that is, the crimes of the Jesuit order. The most memorable of which in the United States, unbeknownst to most Americans, was 9-11. And I fear that Inquisition Update and many other of the truth-tellers on LibertyRadioLive.com have dropped the ball in not spending more time on 9-11 to educate the American people what 9-11 really was. I do, I don't, I'm not going to do it now. I want to finish this book. But I want to tell you, 9-11 was a Jesuit Pearl Harbor-style incident. Fomented in Rome, conducted by Jesuit-trained people in our government, many of them Knights of Malta, the principal of which was George W. Bush, a skull and bones a knight of the most holy Eucharist, a closet Catholic serving his Pope in this country. It was they who perpetrated 9-11 to motivate this country to go to war in the Middle East. And it's a reality that we must come to grips with. God's people must come to an understanding of what 9-11 was. And P.D. Stewart realizes the importance of that, too. And 
I will mention once again that this book that I'm reading, Code Word Barbalon, is book one of a two-book series, the second of which is entitled Antichrist is a Woman. And it's not on the shelves yet. But I recommend that you get this book, Code Word Barbalon, and immediately as soon as it's available, get the second book in this series. Because P.D. Stewart's going to focus on 9-11. And you can bet that I'm going to read that book here on Inquisition Update and use it to help educate the listeners about the truth about 9-11. We have not seen the latest and the greatest of the crimes yet to be committed by the Jesuit order. And I believe what they are planning is going to dwarf anything in world history. I believe that they will resort to wholesale nuclear exchange if necessary to bring about this new world order. I believe that they are fomenting a land invasion of this country at this moment. History will prove whether or not I'm correct, but never forget the Jesuits will have a new world order with a pope of their choosing as the sole sovereign ruler of the world. <clears throat> and that was made readily apparent in the Pope's encyclical Charity and Truth. And so I'll just continue with reading now in this book. It says, These are grave, indeed grave assertions, which we will seek to verify using only the best evidence, for it is an axiom that an historian must have sources, and he who asserts must prove. In this task we shall leave no stone unturned. As the Jesuit professors at Rome say, quote, it is better to overkill than to leave half dead. And let me tell you, P.D. Stewart is going to give overkill to the proof of his assertions in this book. He continues, nor will we waste a single arrow from our quiver. Our words, we hope, shall fly like arrows to their targets. And we shall, where ne- uh, and, and we shall, where necessary, volley with a multitude of proofs in support. The evidence, we hope, will prove conclusive to dissolve any doubts. I assure you, however, dear reader, that we shall seek to use only lawful means in this effort. Nevertheless, you would agree that weapon must match weapon, and wit must match wit, for it is useless to use a walking stick against a bayonet or a crossbow against a rifle. We shall use the hammer of reason to batter the stronghold of iniquity, and we shall pull hard at a few loose strings in the cloak of deception, which when pulled long enough unravels the entire fabric revealing the mystery of iniquity within the papal church, the Roman Catholic Church. When all is done, we shall see, too, that the moral theology of the Jesuits infects all of the secret societies, and that it produces in them all manner of corruptions. In so doing, it is my hope people will be stirred and society aroused to the danger that is fast bearing down upon us, threatening to crush democracy and plant religious fascism upon its ruins. The Jesuits, we shall prove, control the vertical, the horizontal, and almost everything in between. Indeed, for some time now, the Jesuits have been in possession of banking corporations, oil refineries, oil refineries, sugar and other farm operations, mineral mining corporations, and all kinds of commercial operations, bringing in hundreds of thousands of dollars each year, even millions. The Jesuit order can finance any political candidate in millions of U.S. dollars if necessary. The order also owns several multi-million dollar companies, including the Bank of America and Lockheed Martin Aviation Corporation. 
they control the military, industrial, and media complex of this world. The Vatican controls the war-making industry and the information dissemination industry. That's how they control the world. And if this book were to list all the corporations wherein the Jesuit order is a principal investor or owner, it would stagger the mind. It would take pages after pages in this book to list them all. And for those who are in doubt, I recommend the book The Vatican Billions by Avro Manhattan. The Vatican Billions by Avro Manhattan. You can find that. Just Google the title. You'll find the book online or go to shatteringdenial.com and look for it in his library. Shatteringdenial.com. Read The Vatican Billions by Avro Manhattan. Now, continuing, it says, Bank of America was founded in 1904 by an Italian immigrant and staunch Roman Catholic. It was initially called the Bank of Italy, but was renamed the Bank of America in 1928. Its founder was Amadeo Peter Gianni, that is, A.P. Gianni, who was acting as an agent for the Jesuit order, a fact, according to the United States Congress House Committee, that, quote, has never been denied by the Jesuit fathers today. Uh, Excuse me, unquote. Today, the Jesuit order owns 51% of the stock in the Bank of America. See the German magazine Der Spiegel, August 13th, 1958. Der Spiegel is one of Germany's most respected magazines and is Germany's magazine of record. Interestingly, A.P. Gianni, was later appointed regent at the Jesuit-run University of California, Berkeley. Nor are we surprised to learn that Martin Delaney, a Chicago native and Jesuit-educated Catholic who studied for the priesthood, is now, quote, writing training programs for Bank of America, unquote. Bank of America is the creator of the Visa card system in 1977. It could well be called the Jesuit Bank of America. Der Spiegel also says that the Jesuits own controlling stock in Phillips Petroleum. The Jesuits have extensive financial influence in television and radio, too, as well as in the print media. Now, let me just tell you, just stop and interject. You've heard me say this before. I probably don't need to say it again to my regular listeners. But the biggest media magnate in this country, one of the biggest media magnates in the world, is Rupert Murdoch, and he's a devout Roman Catholic and Knight of St. Gregory. I call Fox News the other EWTN, the other Roman Catholic channel. And they're the ones who educate and inform the public what we are to know and not to know. And that's why this country is completely oblivious to the Jesuit hand, the Vatican's hand in our government, and everything that happens in this country, including the financial collapse. And when we finally make the connection, we're going to prove it had a lot to do with the with the Gulf, uh, with the oil spill. Now, continuing, it says these are but a few of the tentacles of the Jesuit Hydra in America. These enterprises they own and run not in the corporate name of the Society of Jesus, but under various agencies of crypto-Jesuits, whose allegiance is to the order and who work under the aegis of the Jesuits. In fact, says one learned author, quote, the Jesuit property holdings are so boundless that they are measured by square miles and by degrees of latitude and longitude rather than by acres or hectares. Unquote. So much for their vow of poverty, right? One of the most, if not the most, wealthy institution in the world, the Jesuit order. And certainly the most powerful. He continues, and we shall see too that throughout their long history, quote, the Jesuits meddling in politics, unquote, and they, quote, use the sacrament of confession to penetrate the designs of princes, leaders, and statesmen, and to manipulate consciences to their own purposes, unquote. 
They even jobbed Bill Clinton into the White House, who said of his Jesuit mentor, quote, as a student at Georgetown, I heard, quote, that call by a professor named Carol Quigley, unquote, Jesuit priest. Yes, he heard his professional call from Carol Quigley, a Jesuit priest. Clinton was Jesuit trained all his life and groomed for the office of the presidency by the Jesuit order. And he ruled this country for the benefit of the papacy. Serve that demon well. And we will for forever, until Christ come, pay the consequences for the influence of the Clintons and the Bushes and the Ronald Reagans. All directly influenced by the Jesuit order who ruled this country for the benefit of the papacy and not the people. That includes Barack Obama. The Pope selects the kings for this country, but not the people. As the former Italian Catholic scholar uh, Paoli Sarpi said in his letters, quote, whenever and wherever the Roman Catholic Church has been in the ascendant, it has been a political institution. And whenever and wheresoever it ceases to be a political power in the land, it instantly becomes a, a political conspiracy. Unquote. Now, I'm fully aware that these assertions and the discussions which follow may well surprise, if not shock you. There are those who will no doubt laugh and poo-poo these things. They will smile and say that this is no more than the enthusiastic working up of the imagination, mere conspiracy theories by which to allure and tickle weak minds. And so upon the very, <clears throat> the very subjects indicated and the above-mentioned connections, I now offer details. For I know the state of minds today, and it does not enter into my plan to ignore any theme, any fact, which might persuade the doubter or convince the skeptic. In the coming pages, we shall offer ready solvents for your incredulities by means of copious amounts of proofs, a superabundance of the best evidence. But first, let us consider an event that transpired in the fall of 1605. Now, we're going to begin this chapter 3. We're not going to have time to get very far into it, but this will prepare your minds for next week. We're going to talk about the early 1600s in England. We're going to talk about an English 9-11. I'm going to talk about the gunpowder plot of 1605 conducted by the Jesuit priests of Rome. The gunpowder plot of 1605, which has largely been forgotten in this country, and even so in England. But when we dis when we read this and discover this, it's going to be impossible for us to comprehend how it could be forgotten. It says, every year... Uh, let me first read a quote uh, at the beginning of this chapter. It says, in whatever place the Catholic of the Catholic world a Jesuit is insulted or resisted, no matter how insignificant he may be, he is sure to be avenged. And this we know. Dead men tell no tales. Ponder well on these things, and remember, you cannot escape us. The words of two Jesuits combined into one during, uh, for this quote. Dead men tell no tales. And that's the, the calling card of the Jesuit order. Open your mouth in... Opposition to the Jesuit order, and you're a marked man. And that explains the assassinations of powerful people throughout history. And it's going to explain the, the, the justification for the gunpowder plot. A Jesuit hit on Great Britain, Protestant Great Britain. 
It says, every year on November 5th, the English celebrate a most infamous event in their glorious history, the Gunpowder Plot of 1605, known variously in some countries as Bonfire Night, Guy Fawkes Night, Fireworks Night, or Pope's Day. The memory of this important event, the daring attempts of a suicide bomber, Guy Fawkes, aided by his friends, is faithfully perpetuated but the background of the performers and their purposes are too little understood, lost in the fireworks. The chief actors and their motives are now revealed, and the first fact we note is that of the 13 Catholic noblemen involved in the daring plot, five of them were Jesuit priests. Well, before the Jesuits' expulsion from Europe, England had already been wise enough to rid herself of the influence of the assassins from her halls of power. On July 3rd, 1580, Queen Elizabeth I, that is the daughter of Henry VIII and his new, or his, uh, his, uh, Protestant, his second wife, Anne Bolin, and we'll get into that later. On July 3rd, 1580, Queen Elizabeth I, the daughter of Henry VIII and Anne Bolin, issued a statute forbidding all Jesuits to enter England. The Queen was already under general excommunication by the Roman Catholic Church by virtue of the bull in Siena Domini, and was forced to take even more decided action when Pope Pius V under the advice of the influential Jesuit Parson and his brethren, had some years earlier passed a bull that forbade all Roman Catholics from taking the oath of allegiance to the English crown. That's right, the Pope told all the Catholics in England, threatened them with ex- excommunication if they took any oath of allegiance to the English crown. The English crown being the legitimate governing authority in England at the time, was Protestant. Their oath of coronation bound them to an oath of allegiance to the Protestant religion. And so the Pope countered with a threat of excommunication to any Catholic who would, who would pledge allegiance to the crown, the Protestant crown of England. And it says, the Pope's thunderbolt read, quote, The number of the ungodly has so much grown in power that there's no place left in the world which they have not tried to corrupt with their most wicked doctrines. Direct reference to Protestantism. And Elizabeth, the pretended Queen of England, the pretended Queen of England, and the servant of crime, that is, the... Uh, overthrow of the controlling power uh, previously was Catholicism, the, the, the Pope. Okay? That was uh, that Protestant Elizabeth was a servant of that crime, the overthrow of the papacy in England, has assisted in this. This very woman, having seized the crown and monstrously usurped the place of the of supreme head of the church in all England, has followed and embraced the errors of the heretics. That's a direct uh, reference to Protestantism. Abolished the sacrifice of the mass, celibacy, and Catholic ceremonies. We are compelled by necessity to take up against her the weapons of justice and declare the nobles, subjects, and people of the said realm and all others who have in any way sworn oaths to her, to be forever absolved of such an oath. We charge and command all and singular, the nobles, subjects, and peoples, of, and others aforesaid, that they do not dare obey her orders, mandates, and laws. Unquote. Now that's direct from the, from the, the papal chair, you know. That is a warning shot from the Pope that they were not to obey Queen Elizabeth I. And so he was fomenting a civil war in England, a religious civil war in England. 
It says the next pope, Gregory the Twelfth, exceeded his predecessor by sending a well-worded letter to his nuncio Sega in Madrid, dated de- December twelfth, fifteen eighty, inciting all Catholics to the murder of the queen. Quote, since that guilty woman, a reference to Queen Elizabeth I of England, rules over two such noble kingdoms of Christendom, that's speaking of England and Ireland, and is the cause of so much injury to the Catholic faith and loss of so many millions of souls, in direct reference to Protestants, there is no doubt that whatever sends her out of the world with the pious intention of doing God's service not only does not sin, but gains merit, especially having regard to the sentence pronounced against her by Pius V of holy memory, in 1570, Pope Pius V had excommunicated Elizabeth from the Catholic Church. Okay, so so they've upped the ante. Anyone who sends heretic, usurper, Protestant usurper, Elizabeth I, out of this world, has not only not committed a sin, but has gain merit, spiritual merit. Does, anybody, does that remind you of any passage in the Scripture? Yes, he that killeth you will think he doeth God's service. And that is a direct reference to the papacy. The papacy used those very words to incite the killing of Protestants in Great Britain. And who is any one of us to think that the papacy hasn't repented, uh, has repented of, of any of those sentiments? What one of us could suggest that the papacy is now embracing Protestantism because he's sorry? Vatican Council II was a sham. And that's about to become readily apparent to anybody with an eye to see or an ear to hear in this country. It's going to be all-out war. And many of us are not even going to realize who it is that's killing us or why. And that's why I'm reading this book. Code word Barbalon, 666, Danger in the Vatican, the Sons of Loyola and Their Plans for World Domination by P.D. Stewart. Get it from Lux Verbi Books. Order it today. My prayers to God's people. Make your peace with Christ. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media Channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on satellite, internet, or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening.
Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn, the Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a re-established Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions, and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit Cross the Border dot org c-r-o-s-s cross the border dot org to get your print epub or pdf version of nicholas arthur's new book titled when the third temple is built that's cross the border dot org